uh, welcome. In the previous uh, lectures, we have looked at the general idea about what we mean by machine learning and we have also introduced you to the task of concept learning or classification. In today's class, we are going to study algorithms for learning decision trees which can be used as classifiers for the concept learning task. In today's lecture, the objective is that the students will be become familiar with the definition of a decision tree, what a decision tree is and how a decision tree can be used as a classifier. The student will also learn an algorithm to construct a decision tree from a given set of training examples, induction of decision trees. We will also introduce the student to the concept of information gain and entropy and how these are used to construct a decision tree. Uh, later we will also look at we will try to review how learning algorithms are reviewed in terms of the training set error and test set error. Uh, we will also show how overfitting occurs in decision trees and in a later class we will look at how overfitting can be avoided in decision trees. So, let us come to what a decision tree is. A decision tree is a classifier in the form of a tree structure. A decision tree is a tree through which we make decision. So, the tree in the decision tree has a number of nodes. The leaf nodes indicate the value of the class or the value of the target attribute. So, you have a set of training examples. The training examples consist of a number of features or attributes. One of the attributes is the target attribute which denotes the class that you are trying to learn. In the decision tree, we will just look at examples of the decision tree presently. The leaf nodes correspond to one of the classes that the classifier is trying to learn. And the internal nodes are called the decision nodes. The internal nodes usually specify some test to be carried out. And usually for most most of the algorithms that we will study, a decision node usually tests the value of a single attribute and corresponding to each value of the attribute, you follow one of the branches that come out of this node. So, let us now look at an example of a decision tree. So, this is a decision tree which has been constructed to decide whether uh, for a particular loan applicant, whether the loan should be approved or rejected. So, at the root, the attribute employed is checked. So, employed in this case is a Boolean attribute. If employed is no, if the person is not employed, then the attribute credit score is checked. If the attribute credit score has value high, then the loan is approved. If the attribute credit score has value low, the loan is rejected. On the other hand, if the person is employed, then income is checked. If income is high, loan is approved. If income is low, the loan is rejected. So, this is an example of a decision tree. As you can see, there are four leaf nodes in this decision tree. Two of them correspond to approve and two of them correspond to reject. There are three internal nodes in this particular decision tree corresponding to the attributes employed, credit score and income. And from every internal node, there are a number of branches corresponding to the different values that this attribute can take. Employed can take the value of yes or no. Credit score can take the value of high or low, income can take the values of high or low. So, this is an example of a decision tree. This is an example of 
another decision tree and this decision tree has been constructed to find out whether a person likes a particular type of food. Now, there are several attributes that we have used. Some of these are test, dry, hot and so on. Test can be sweet, sour or bitter, dry can be yes or no, hot can be yes or no. Now, look at this decision tree. The, at the root, we check the attribute taste. So, if taste is sweet, then you check the attribute dry. If dry is yes, then this food is liked. The answer is yes. If dry is no, answer is no. If taste is sour, then the attribute hot is checked. If hot is yes, then the food is liked. If hot is no, then you check the attribute dry. If dry is no, the food is liked. If dry is yes, food is not liked. If test is bitter, the food is not liked. So, this is an example of another decision tree. Note that the height of the different, the depth of the different leaves vary, right. For example, the test is bitter, this food is not liked irrespective of the other attributes. If the food is sour, then if it is hot, it is liked. If it is not hot, but it is dry, not dry also, then it is liked. Otherwise, it is not liked and so on. Now, you note that each internal node in the decision tree tests an attribute. Each leaf node assigns a classification and each branch corresponds to an attribute value. The internal nodes, there are four internal nodes here, test, dry, hot and dry. Each of them tests one attribute. Each leaf node assigns a classification liked or not liked. Each branch corresponds to an attribute value. So, let us come to the formal definition of a decision tree. A decision tree is a tree in which each non-leaf node has associated with it an attribute or a feature. Each leaf node has associated with it a classification. In case the concept learning problem is a two class problem, the classes can be plus or minus. In general, there could be a finite number of classes. Each arc in the decision tree corresponds to one possible value of the attribute of its pair. Okay. So, decision tree is defined in terms of its components, the internal nodes, the leaves and the branches. The leaves are the classes, the internal nodes are the decision nodes where an attribute value is checked. The branches coming out of the decision tree correspond to the different values that the attribute can take. A decision tree can be used for classification. It is used to classify an example. So, how do we classify using a decision tree? You start from the root node. You follow the appropriate decision branches corresponding to the attribute values of the example that you have got. On reaching a leaf node, the predicted class is obtained. For example, let us look at this uh, decision tree and let us look at this test data. We have a test data whose taste is sour, dry is no, hot is no and color is red. Now, for this test data, let us apply this to the decision tree. So, initially we come to the root, taste is sour. So, we will follow this branch. So, we first check the value of test taste is sour to follow this branch. We check the value of hot. Hot is no, so we follow this branch. Check the value of dry. Dry is no, so we come to this leaf and this leaf says yes, the food is liked. 
you note that in the training set there could be other attributes for example color which has not been used in the decision tree because the decision tree takes uh, finds the correct class without consulting this attribute either along this path or maybe in the entire tree for example color is not used in this entire tree suppose there is another training set whose taste is sweet let us say dry is yes hot is yes color equal to yellow now to find the class of this training example using the decision tree one would follow this buffer the test is checked and test is sweet then dry is checked dry is yes so the food is liked the attributes hot or color are not checked now with this introduction i will ask you to uh, see what a decision tree can represent what are the types of functions that can be represented by a decision tree let us assume for simplicity that all the attributes are boolean attributes and let us uh, also assume that the classification problem is a boolean classification problem now in a decision tree you follow the different uh, different branches and you get to there are some leaves at the bottom now some of the leaves are classified as yes some of the leaves are classified as no so if there are two yes leaf the the concept is either concept is true if you either reach if you reach either this leaf or that leaf so if either of the leaves is reached corresponding to the each leaf you follow a path and you reach that leaf if you your decision the decision that you make at the path from the root to that leaf all the decisions follow the particular branch so a particular leaf can be represented as a conjunction of values and if you have more than one leaf which are marked as positive you can uh, treat them as a disjunction of those conjunctions so you can easily see that a decision tree in general can represent a disjunction of conjunctions any disjunction of conjunctions can be represented by a decision tree as an exercise i will ask you to look at the following functions uh, assume that you have for the first three assume that you have two attributes a and b so you are required to represent the and function the or function and the xor functions for the attributes a p in other words you have to find a decision tree to represent a and b another decision tree to represent a or b another decision tree to represent a x or b for the fourth case i will ask you to find a decision tree to represent the majority function given that you have five attributes a b c d and e so you want to find the majority of these five attributes so please try this and let us see whether you can come up with a decision tree now let's uh, go to the learning problem for decision tree so you have seen that given a decision tree you can use the decision tree so that given a training example you can find the class of the training example now given the training set how can you get a decision tree so the in the learning problem you'll be given a set of training examples by processing the training examples you will come up with a decision tree 
and you will use this decision tree to classify new training examples. So, the technique that we will employ is a greedy technique to find a decision tree given the training data. Now, the decision trees uh, algorithms have been arrived at by different people in different fields because this has a lot of applications. The basic algorithm that we will talk about today is based on the ID3 algorithm which was developed by Ross Quinlan based on the CLS algorithm. Now, the algorithm that we will talk about is a greedy algorithm. You are given to training data and you want to come up with a decision tree. Now, there could be different decision trees, a large number of decision trees that you could look for. So, instead of searching the entire space of decision trees, what we will do is use a simple greedy algorithm to induce decision tree. The algorithm is a top down greedy algorithm. It starts by deciding which node to make a root node. Once the root node is fixed, it tries to find the children of that node, then fixes each of these nodes and try to find the children of those nodes and so on. So, this algorithm is based on top down induction of decision trees. Now, let us uh, look at the basic steps in the algorithm. In the first step, you try to find out the best decision attribute for the next node. So, you have got with you a set of training examples, let us say S. Now, based on S, you find, you try to find that attribute A, which is adjudged to be the best decision attribute for this node. Now, you fix A to be the decision attribute of this node. So, you make uh, wait. So, you make a the root of the decision tree at the current node. Now, you find out all possible values that A can take. Suppose, A can take the values true and false. For each value of A, you create a new descendant. Now, these new descendant can be a leaf node or an internal node. Now, if all the training examples for which A is true, if all these training examples belong to the same class, that is all of them are positive or all of them are negative, make this a leaf node and label it by the value of the target attribute. If you see that the examples which come to this branch are a mixture of positive and negative examples, then you try to make another tree to fit here. So, you do this recursively. So, here you find the next attribute which is adjudged to be the best attribute and corresponding to the different values of the attribute, you again construct decision trees for its children. So, this is the sense of the decision tree learning algorithm. Step 1, let A be the best decision attribute for next node. Assign A as decision attribute for node. For each value of A, create a new descendant. Now, initially you had the set of training examples S. You find that subset of S for which A is true, they will come here. You find that subset of A for which A is false, they will come here. So, you sort the training examples to the appropriate leaf node according to the attribute value of the branch. If all training examples are perfectly classified, stop, otherwise iterate this algorithm over the new nodes. So, we will now describe the ID3 algorithm of Quinlan. So, this was one of the oldest algorithms devised by Quinlan. In the next class, we will look at newer versions of ID3 algorithm 
C4.5, C5.0, CART, etc. So the IT3 algorithm has inputs the set of attributes ATTS, Q is the target attribute and S is the set of training examples. So, you are given the set of training examples, you are given a set of non-target attributes ATS and a target attribute is Q and the ID3 algorithm will take these inputs, construct a decision tree and return the decision tree. Now, let us look at the details of this algorithm. Now, this is the details of this algorithm. If S is empty, that is there are no examples left, return a single node with value failure or return a single node with a default class. Step 2, if S is not empty, but consists of records of the same class. So, if all the examples in S belong to the same class, you make this node a leaf node with the value of that class and label it with the value of that class. Otherwise, if ATS is empty, that is there are no more attributes left, then return a single node and label this node with the majority classification of the examples. So, S is the set of examples that you have. You find the majority class that the these examples belong to and since there are no more attributes left to make a decision node, you make a leaf there with the majority classification. Otherwise, that is if S is non-empty, but S is not homogeneous, that is S consists of both positive as well as negative examples and ATS is not empty. Then what do you do? Let us expand this in the next slide. Then this is what you do, you choose the best attribute out of ATS. So, ATS is the attributes that you have left, you choose the best attributes out of ATS and let that be A. And how do you choose the best attribute? You do it by processing the training in set S. We will soon uh, discuss some heuristics that are used to select the best attribute. Remember this is a greedy algorithm. Now, once you have chosen this decision attribute A, you are trying to, you will try to construct a decision tree which will have A as its root. So, tree, you will construct the tree and initially let tree be a new decision tree whose root is A. Now, for the attribute A, you find all the values Vj that A can take. Let Sj be the subset of S with A equal to Vj. So, you have all the training examples S, you find all the values that this attribute can take and you make so many branches. In each branch, you push those examples for which the attribute of A has the value of Vj. So, the training set that you have at the root that will be partitioned into several subsets. So, the uh, subset Sj will contain those training examples for which A equal to Vj. Now, at this branch, you will make a subtree, which you denote by sub t and you get it by recursively calling id3 with the remaining attributes at minus a, the target attribute q and the subset of training examples at this node s j. Why at minus a? At the current node, you have used up the attribute a. So, you have come to this branch for a equal to v j. Now, this attribute a will no longer be available for further deciding the class. So, you remove A from your attribute set and you call the decision tree algorithm 
recursively on the remaining examples S j that come to this branch. Now, you will add a branch to the tree with label V j and subtree sub t and you will return this tree. So, let us just uh, try to show what is happening. You start with the training examples S. You find that attribute A which is the best attribute for this training example. How to find it that we will talk about later. Now, once you fix this attribute, you look at the different values that this attribute can take. Suppose it can take true and false. So, what you will do is that corresponding to this, you find out what is the whether all the examples that come here. So, the examples that come here, let us say they are called S1 and S2. Now, if S1 is wholly positive or wholly negative, this will be a leaf node. Otherwise, you will select another attribute which is adjudged the best attribute at this node and corresponding to that, you will again sort the training example S1 into S11 and S12. S11 for D is equal to true and S12 for D equal to false. And then you will get this new node and corresponding to this new node, you will construct a subtree and you will uh, put this subtree on the left side here and corresponding to this, you will construct another subtree which you will put it here. Okay. So, this is how the decision tree learning proceeds. So, you see that this algorithm is a greedy algorithm. It does greedy selection. ID3 tries to find the attribute that best separates the training examples. You have some training examples and you try to find an attribute. So, what is the motivation, which attribute will you adjust the best? You see, ID3 stops when you get to a leaf where all the examples have the same class. So, if S is a mixture of positive and negative examples, you try to use an attribute which will ultimately give the positive, put the positive and negative examples separately. So, you try to select that attribute which can achieve a separation from positive and negative examples in the best possible manner. For this, the algorithm uses a greedy search and the algorithm never backtracks. Now, which attribute do you want to select? There could be several uh, strategies that you can employ. You can select the attribute completely randomly. You can use the heuristic list values. That is, you choose the attribute with the smallest number of possible values. Another heuristic is you can choose max values that is choose the attribute which has the largest number of pos possible values or you can choose the heuristic max gain which corresponds to choosing the attribute with the largest expected information gain. So, this max gain is the heuristic that we will study and it has been uh, found to be a very effective heuristic for learning decision trees. Now, what is the motivation behind this heuristic? The bias, you see in any inductive learning algorithm, we use a bias which tells us whether to prefer uh, one particular classifier over the other. The sort of bias that we use in this case is a preference for short classifiers or a preference for short trees. So, we will just uh, recall a principle which has been widely known as the Occam's razor. Occam's razor uh, decrees that entities should not be multiplied unnecessarily. What it has come to mean is that the simplest hypothesis uh, should be chosen over more complex ones if they have the same performance 
over the data. So, suppose you have some training data and there are a number of decision trees possible which are all consistent with the training data, then you should select the one which is shortest, which is simplest. In other words, the smallest decision tree that correctly classifies all the training examples should be selected. Unfortunately, trying to find the smallest decision tree that is consistent with the examples is known to be an NP hard problem. So, it is a very difficult problem, it is not easy to find the smallest decision tree. So, what we do is we use a heuristic instead and this heuristic tries to find the smallish decision tree right and we try to use this idea use this heuristic in order to decide which attribute to select. So, our goal is try to try to select the attribute that will result in the smallest expected size of the subtree rooted at the children. So, we have a choice of attributes and we try to select that attribute for which the subtree rooted at the children will be small. And a heuristic that we will use is the information gain heuristic. The information gain heuristic is a good quantitative measure of the worth of an attribute. It measures how well a given attribute separates the training examples according to their target classification. As I have mentioned below, your objective is to achieve a separation from the positive from the negative examples. So, you try to select that attribute which achieves this separation maximally. So, this is a heuristic that you will use and information gain can do this quite effectively. Now, let us uh, look at some example. Suppose you have um, some uh, objects and you want to classify them as being a chair or not a chair. And you have some objects, suppose initially you have 50 posit pos positive examples and 50 negative examples. And you have a choice of many attributes. Let us say two of the attributes are backrest and material. Suppose the attribute backrest, it has values yes and no. Among objects with backrest, yes, there are 51 such objects, 46 of them are chairs, 5 are non-chairs. There are 49 objects with no backrest, 4 of them are chairs, 45 are non-chairs. On the other hand, if we look at the attribute material, the value of the material can be wood or plastic. For material equal to wood, there are 55 objects, 35 positive, 20 negative. For material equal to plastic, there are 45 objects, 15 positive and 30 negative. Now, which of these attributes is better? Can you tell me which attribute is better? You see that initially, the examples are a mixture, uniform mixture of 50 positive and 50 negative examples. So, there is a uh, so, each one each being a chair or non-chair is equally likely. For backrest equal to yes, we see that a large majority are chairs, a small a few ones are non-chairs. For backrest equal to no, a large majority are non-chairs, only a few are chairs. For material equal to wood, a majority is chair, 35, 20 are non-chairs, but here the percentage of positive examples is not very high. Similarly, here are 15 plus and 30 minus more negative, but this sort of distribution is less homogeneous than the distribution you get when you use backrest. So, uh, if you really want to achieve a separation from the positive and negative examples, maybe this is a better option. This is likely to be a better option. So, backrest is likely to be a better option to distinguish the positive examples from negative examples. 
This however does not guarantee that in conjunction with another feature material may prove to be a very good option. So, we really are not looking ahead and we are only making a greedy choice based on the current information. So, we will use information gain to select the best attribute. Our goal is to construct a small decision tree that correctly classifies the training example. And we will look for the attribute for which we have uh, low, we get examples with low information content. That is more homogeneous example set that is most of the examples belong to the same class. The decision tree is needed to differentiate. So, uh, the, our heuristic is that if the examples that we have is mostly belonging, they, are mo they mostly belong to the same class, then the decision tree that will be needed to classify those examples would be smaller. So, this is the idea based on which we use this sort of heuristic. Now, how will we determine the information gain on using a particular attribute? So, first of all, we have to have a measure for the information content of a set of examples. We will presently see that we use the concept of entropy to find the information content or measure of purity and impurity of a set of examples. Now, once we have a measure of the information content, we look at the different uh, situations that we will get by using different attributes at the root. So, when we use an attribute A at the root, we split the examples into different classes corresponding to the different values of A. Now, we find the resulting sets and find the information content of each of the resulting sets, take the average, weighted average and compare it with the original information content. If the information content becomes lower, this is a, a reasonable attribute to take. So, we find out how that attribute for which the information content becomes the lowest after splitting on that attribute and we will select that attribute. So, we are trying to determine the information gain on using a particular attribute and we will split the examples on the selected attributes possible values and we find the difference in the information content of a node and the information content after the node is split. And as I mentioned that to measure the information content of a set of examples S, we will use the concept of entropy. Suppose S is a sample of training examples that we have, wait, S is the sample of training examples that we have and let us say in the sample S, P is the proportion of positive examples, N is the proportion of negative examples. Entropy measures the impurity of S. It is defined to be minus P log P minus N log N, where P is the proportion of positive examples, N is the proportion of negative examples, logarithm is to the base 2. So, this definition is if we have only two classes. In general, if you have a number of classes, then entropy of the set of examples is defined to be minus sigma of p i log p i, where p i denotes the probability, p i denotes the fraction of examples which belong to class c i okay? and we sum it over all c i. So, this is the general definition of entropy when you have arbitrary number of classes. Now, the entropy function can be plotted for the two class problem as shown here. So, this is an approximate um, shape of the entropy curve. We have 
plotted entropy on the y axis with the value of p on the x axis. We see that when p is 0, entropy is 0, when p is 1, entropy is 1 and the curve has a shape, uh, uh, the curve has a shape like this. Uh, so, we see that, uh, wait, we see that the entropy is maximum when p is half, when p is half entropy is 1, when p is 0 and 1 entropy is smallest. So, the impurity of the data is maximum when p is half, that is we have exactly equal number of positive and negative examples, then the impurity is maximum. Impurity is smallest when either p is 1 that is all examples are positive or p is 0 that is all examples are negative. If p is half we have a mixture. So, entropy is a measure of the impurity. In information theory, entropy is actually interpreted as the expected number of bits to encode a class. Suppose you have two classes plus or minus and you get randomly drawn examples of S. Entropy denotes the expected number of bits to encode a class. Suppose all the class is positive, then you require 0 bits to indicate whether the object belongs to a positive class or negative class because you know all classes are positive. If all classes are negative, also the same thing will happen. If classes are can be either positive or negative with equal probability, you can use 1 bit to encode uh, the classes as 0 or 1. Suppose positive classes are more frequent than negative classes, what you can do is that you can choose an encoding so that a positive class uses smaller number of bits than a negative class. So, patterns involving positive classes will be more likely and to encode them you can use smaller number of bits. So, information theory, uh, we find the optimal length code and it is found that if a message if has probability p, then you require uh, optimally minus log p bits to encode that message. So, the expected number of bits to encode a random member of S by information theory is given by minus p log p minus n log n, which is how entropy is defined. And we will use this concept in use in deciding the information content of a set of examples that we get in a decision tree. So, entropy characterizes the impurity of a collection. So, just to give an example, suppose S is a collection of 6 positive and 4 negative examples. Entropy of S can be computed as minus 6 by 10 log 6 by 10 minus 4 by 10 log 4 by 10 which can be evaluated to be 0.97. If the target attribute takes m different values, that is there are m classes, then the entropy of S with respect to the m wise classification is defined as minus sigma p i log p i, we already discussed this, where p i is the proportion of S belonging to class c i. Now, how would we use information gain to select the best attribute? So, we introduce the concept of remainder A. So, suppose we have a set of training examples S, we can find its entropy. Now, when we classify using A, we split S into different subsets. We define remainder A as the weighted sum of the information content of each of these subsets. So, S is partitioned into subsets by possible values of the attribute, remainder A is the weighted sum of the entropy of these subsets. So, remainder A can be taken to measure the total disorder or inhomogeneity of the children nodes when you classify using the attribute A. So, the expected reduction in entropy caused by partitioning the examples using the attribute A is given by gain S A. So, gain S A 
is defined to be entropy S minus remainder A. And remainder A is weighted sum of entropy S V. S V is the uh, subset of S for which the value is V and we sum it over all values of V. All V is all classes that uh, we can have, all attribute values that A can take. So, we define the best attribute to be the attribute for which K in S A is maximum or equivalently for which remainder A is minimum. Now, let us look at an example of a decision tree. So, we have some training data. The training data has three attributes, state, season and barometer and the attribute which we are trying to learn is weather. State can be A K, H I, C A, uh, A K, H I or C A, season can be winter or summer, barometer can be down or up and we are trying to predict whether the weather is snow or sun or rain. So, target attribute is weather and the other attributes are state, season and barometer. Now, let us see, let us look at each of these attributes. For the attribute state, it can have three values A K, H I and C A. In A K, we find there are three examples, two snow, one sun. In H I, there are three sun, C A, there are two rain, one sun. So, entropy of A K is 0.92, of H I is 0 of C A is 0.92. So, the average reduction in information content is given by 0.62 or average information content is given by 0.62. For the attribute season, for the value winter there are 2 snow, 2 sun, 1 rain. Summer there are 3 sun, 1 rain. For C A there are 2 rain, 1 sun and the average entropy is 1.2. For barometer corresponding to down, we have 1 snow, 4 sun corresponding to up, we have 1 snow, 1 sun, 2 rain. So, the average entropy is 1.07. So, the minimum entropy, uh, we get the minimum entropy if you use state as the attribute and the maximum entropy if you use season as the attribute. So, for state equal to A k, so you can use state to split the root. For state equal to A k, we can split on season. For state equal to H i, we get a leaf node. For state equal C a, we can split on barometer and we can finally get this decision tree. For state equal to A k, we split on season. If it is summer, then it is sun. Winter, it is snow. For state equal to H i, it is always sun. For state equal to C a, you look at barometer, if barometer is down, it is sun, if barometer is up, it is rain. So, this is a decision tree that you get from the table by using the information gain heuristic, the details you have to work out. Now, we will uh, uh, briefly introduce, we will briefly review uh, how we will evaluate a decision tree. So, once we have constructed a decision tree, we want to know how good the decision tree is. And you know that when you get a classifier, you evaluate the classifier by computing its accuracy or equivalently by finding the error. Now, how would you use the classifier? You would use the classifier to predict the classification of a new training example. So, given a distribution of a possible examples, we want a classifier for which the true error given the distribution of examples is smallest. But what you have with you is a set of training examples. You can evaluate the training error with respect to the training examples and you want to evaluate in and this is what you can evaluate, but you really want to find the true error. So, to review the true error of a hypothesis H with respect to a target function F and a distribution D is the probability that H will misclassify an instance drawn randomly according to D. 
So, the true error of a hypothesis H is the probability that H x does not agree with F x. The sample error is what you get from the training sample. The sample error of H with respect to target function F and data sample S is the proportion of examples that H misclassifies. And uh, what we will try to do is that we can, uh, you see we do not have the true error with us, but we will use the sample error as a indicator of the true error. But if we use the training error to learn our hypothesis and use the same training set to evaluate the hypothesis, we are actually cheating because we, we have the scope to fit the classifier with the training data. So, in order to get a better idea of the true error, what we do is we uh, divide, we keep aside some of the uh, data that we had as the test set, which we do not use to train the classifier. Typically, uh, this is the sort of um, behavior that you get. As the decision, for if you are using a decision tree, as decision tree size increases, typically the accuracy on the training set increases. Initially, you have a small accuracy, but as you grow the decision tree, the accuracy on the training set increases. However, the accuracy on the test set initially increases after which it may go down. So, this is a typical behavior that take place and this is due to overfitting. And uh, in a later class, in the next class, we will see how uh, decision trees can be pruned to avoid overfitting. But based on this curve, you see that this is the optimal tree size for which the test set accuracy is highest. Okay. So, one can think of stop growing the decision tree when uh, at this point and how you can find it out? You can keep aside a test set and when you have the decision tree at various stages, you check its accuracy on the test set you select that tree for which the test set accuracy is highest. And uh, so, this is one method. The other method is to grow the entire decision tree and then prune the decision tree. So, details of this we will study in the next lecture. So, accuracy on training data increases as the decision tree grows and accuracy on the test data initially increases, but then decreases. So, we will discuss that later. So, before we stop today, let us discuss some practical applications of decision trees. Decision trees have been used for classifying patients by disease. They have been used for diagnosis of breast cancer. For a particular data set, it was found that humans are correct, human doctors are correct 65 percent of the time and a decision tree classifier was found to have an accuracy of 75 percent higher than that of human experts. Decision trees have been used for classifying equipment malfunctions, for classifying loan applications by level of risk. BP designed a decision tree for separating gas and oil for offshore oil platforms. Another application was learning to fly a Cessna by observing pilots on a simulator. Data was generated by observing three skilled human pilots performing a fixed flight plan 30 times each. 90,000 training examples were obtained. There are 20 attributes. The class was the action taken like thrust, flap, etc. The algorithm used was the learning algorithm C 4.5 and this tree was inserted into the flight simulators control loop and tested. The program learned to fly somewhat better than its teachers. The generalization process cleans up mistakes by humans. So, this was a quite successful exercise. So, we stop today uh, with some questions on this lecture. Question number one, 
give decision trees to represent the following Boolean functions. A, not A and B or C and not D. B, A and B or C. Third, parity function with four inputs A, B, C and D. Question number two, given the following data set, construct a decision tree, show all the steps. The decision tree is given in this slide, so please note it down. So in this data set, there are four attributes, district, house type, income, previous customer and the result is the outcome. This is what you are trying to learn. The outcome can be nothing or respondent. District is suburban or rural or urban. House type is detached or semi-detached or terrace. Income is high or low. Previous customer, yes or no. So note down the examples. There are 14 examples. Example 1, district is suburban, house type detached, income high, previous customer, no, outcome, nothing. 2, district suburban, detached, high, yes, outcome, nothing. 3, rural, detached, high, no, responded. 4, urban, semi-detached, high, no, responded. 5, urban, semi-detached, low, no, responded. 6, urban, semi-detached, low, yes, nothing. 7, rural, semi-detached, low, yes, responded. 8, suburban, terrace, high, no, nothing. 9, suburban, semi-detached, low, no, responded. 10, urban, terrace, low, no, responded. 11, suburban, terrace, low, yes, responded. 12, rural, terrace, high, yes, responded. 13, rural, detached, low, no, responded. 14, urban, terrace, high, yes, nothing. With this, we stop today's lecture. Thank you.